The Bitcoin price has continued to fall on Tuesday, extending losses all the way down to levels not seen since January, retracing below 30,000 for the first time since the start of the year. We're speaking with Saifdin Amus, author of The Bitcoin Standard, and now his new book, The Fiat Standard, and an independent educator at Saifdin.com. Dr. Amos, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Saifdi, we're going to talk about all things Bitcoin. And I want to talk about, of course, your new book, The Fiat Standard, and what uh, readers can learn and expect to uh, learn from you. But first, let's talk about recent news. China, as you know, has been cracking down on Bitcoin transactions, essentially making over-the-counter transactions almost illegal. And of course, that has brought the price down to uh, multi-month lows. What do you make of this news? Is this a concern for investors, or should people just shrug it off? Well, it's a little bit difficult to say so early because it's um, we, we've had plenty of these uh, false alarms before, particularly from China, where you know we hear news that says things along the line of this is going to be Bitcoin is going to be criminalized, and then um, a few months later you hear it happening again and again and again, which shows that it hasn't really been quite effective at um, achieving its goals. It seems like this time is a little bit more serious. You know, we've, we've had many China bans before. It is a joke uh, among Bitcoiners that, yeah, China bans Bitcoin. It's banned Bitcoin 50 times at least so far. Um, and every time it turns out that, you know, maybe either they go back on the decision or that it wasn't really a ban. It was um, uh, a ban of a particular operator or a ban in a particular region. But it looks like this time, um, it, it seems to be much more serious and we can see it in terms of the hash rate declining. So a lot of miners seem to in fact be going offline. And also we can see it in terms of the price. And I think it makes sense that if this would happen, we would witness uh, a decline in the price because, you know, these miners were uh, essentially handled a very massive uh, business uh, shock uh, where, you know, their business have to stop operating in China and they need to find a place, so they need to find somewhere else in the world where they can um, relocate. So that's a huge um, new expenditure that they need to uh, come up with. And uh, basically, you know, if you're a Bitcoin miner, you're in that business most likely because you uh, have high conviction in Bitcoin and you want to hold Bitcoin. So when you are subject to a crisis like this that uh, creates problems for your uh, uh, operation, you know, the um, thing that you will have to sell is most likely going to be Bitcoin because you have a lot of Bitcoin. So I think it's um, it seems like, you know, the, the, the impact is that miners are having to sell a lot of their coins. They're having to liquidate a lot of their coins in order to finance the move of the equipment. And that seems to be um, quite uh, serious. Now, in terms of the, what's really not clear is the um, banning of transactions. I'm not so sure how that's going to work out because we've heard that one uh, several times before, but it has continued. Um, and of course, it's, uh, you know, this is going to put to test uh, Bitcoin censorship resistance because, sure, governments can ban um, transactions from their financial system into Bitcoin. But the question then becomes, um, well, what can they do about people transacting Bitcoin directly for goods um, without having to go through their financial system or people using physical cash uh, and transacting Bitcoin with it? So, um, you know, with time, as the network, as the Bitcoin network grows and the size of the Bitcoin economy grows, yeah. the ability of people to conduct trades with one another uh, based purely on Bitcoin increases. And so these bans can become less effective. So it'll be quite interesting to see how this one unfolds. Um, but yeah. uh, I tend to think that it's likely going to be a short term, medium term uh, impact. I think it's it, it doesn't change anything in Bitcoin in the long run because, you know, of the economic properties of Bitcoin and the way that it works. I, I, I don't think uh, I, I think it can handle a shock like this. I was reading uh, the news and according to a uh, state-run Chinese newspaper, 90% uh, of China's mining capacity has been shut down over the weekend. Now, I was reading also that 65% of global Bitcoin mining comes from China. And you were talking about the hash rate. That's reflected in the hash rate. It's been declining ever since May and it's really taken a dive in the last couple of couple of days to weeks. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Saifting, but shouldn't the logic be that once you have less mining, you, ha you bring up the scarcity of the coin and the price should increase. Why are we seeing the reverse happen? 
Yeah, no, that doesn't quite work like that in Bitcoin yeah. because in Bitcoin, the uh, reward for mining, the amount of mining that's going to come out every day is independent of the number of miners that come in. That's what makes Bitcoin unique. And that's a key point in my book, which is mm -hmm. Bitcoin is the first good whose supply is completely independent of demand. It doesn't matter if five people are using Bitcoin today or five billion people are using Bitcoin. It doesn't matter if five people are mining Bitcoin or five billion people are trying to mine Bitcoin. Every day in this year, we're roughly getting in this period, in this four year period from last year until three years from now, we're getting roughly 900 new Bitcoins a day or about six Bitcoins every 10 minutes. That's uh, th that's going to remain constant regardless of what happens with the quantity of mining. There is a period of adjustment every two weeks. The difficulty adjusts. Um, and, and, and so there are times where it can be faster than 10 minutes or slower than 10 minutes. So to get more than 900 or less than 900 every day. But roughly, it's going to be around 900. So what ends up happening is that the way that Bitcoin mining works is that the reward is fixed. And then the difficulty of the mining adjusts depending on the number of people who are mining in order to ensure that the reward is uh, not exceeded. And so I like to think of it like a sports competition where uh, as opposed to, say, gold mining, where if you, there's the amount of gold that is mined is a function of how many people are mining and how many people are digging. So yes. You have a lot of people going into mining Bitcoin or copper or any um, natural metal. Uh, they're going. The more they dig, the more they make. And so the more demand there is, the higher the price rises, the more production rises. That doesn't work with Bitcoin. What happens with Bitcoin is the more people get in, the prize is fixed. It's more like a sports competition. So if more people compete to win the World Cup or the European Championship or the 100 meter dash at the Olympics, the more people compete, there's still only going to be one trophy or one medal to be given to the winner. And when more people compete, only thing that happens is that it gets harder for you to be the one who wins it. Okay, so the price decline is not a reflection of the, the, the supply of Bitcoin, but rather a reflection of maybe investor sentiment on uh, the use case of Bitcoin. Would that be a fair statement to make? Potentially. I mean, I am not so sure about what is happening with uh, Chinese investors or with other investors. But yeah, pro most likely there are people who think that, um, you know, this okay. is less attractive as, a, as yeah. a prospect right now. But I think probably a, a, a significant part of it is the cost of relocation for miners. Miners need to sell a lot more of their coins now because they need to relocate. And when that happens, they are, um, you know, you're, you're forcing some very hard hodlers who would usually be holding uh, very hard uh, Bitcoin for the long term. You're forcing them to sell large quantities. And I think this can be very significant on the price. Now, um, Saifedean, as you, as you may have observed, of course, the transaction fees for Bitcoin and also Ethereum have also gone up a lot in the last year. In fact, if you actually put the chart of let's say, the transaction fees of Bitcoin and overlay that with the price, you'll notice a correlation. Why is that transaction fees are somewhat correlated to price? And do you think the high fees have anything to do with um, uh, the correction of the price of Bitcoin that we've seen over the last few months? Um, I, you know, the, the fees have been rising over the past year. I'm not so sure that the um, last few months have made a big dent. Mm -hmm. uh, in rising effects, probably the other way around. You're right that there is a correlation when the price goes up, the fees go up. And that's because, you know, when the price goes up, that means more demand for Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is fixed. There's no way of making more Bitcoin beyond what is already scheduled. But another thing that's also scarce and fixed like Bitcoin is Bitcoin block space. So there's only so many Bitcoin transactions that you can fit into every Bitcoin block. We have one block every 10 minutes, mm -hmm. and each block is uh, roughly around one uh, megabyte in size. So there's uh, only so many transactions that you can fit into it. And so when there is um, high price movements, when price is rising, that means more people are buying, more people are transacting, and that means more demand for block space. And so block space transaction fees rise. And I think uh, you know, uh, the, the way that I see it, I think um, Bitcoin transaction fees are likely to rise, to rise a lot more over time. If Bitcoin is going to succeed, um, it's not going to increase the number of on-chain transactions. On-chain transactions can't increase by much. What's going to happen is that the value of these transactions can increase and the transaction costs will increase. And that's why in the Bitcoin standard, I argue it's better to think of Bitcoin as a 
settlement network rather than a consumer payments network because there are very hard limits on how much the network itself can uh, handle. And of course, I'm referring here to the network on-chain transactions. Um, second layer transactions like Lightning don't involve uh, paying the on-chain transaction fee, or at mm -hmm. least you pay them only when you set up a channel. With these transactions, you're going to see more of the consumer uh, layer. Um, it's more like a consumer payment network. Okay, let's talk about the Bitcoin standard now for uh, those people who have not, have not yet read the book. Your central thesis, of course, is that Bitcoin is a decentralized network. Nobody can, nobody, no authority can control it. And you've outlined the historical context of the rise of Bitcoin. Now, if I were to tell you, Saif D, not all governments agree with your assessment, how would you respond? Yeah, I think uh, generally, I, I think governments would be the last to uh, see uh, Bitcoin. I think that's hopefully a good well, thing. Well, I think El Salvador would agree with you. Let's just let's just put that on the record. <laughs> yeah, El Salvador would agree. I think that was a bit of a surprise for me uh, because I thought, you know, governments would be the last to get this. But uh, the yeah. El Salvadorian president uh, seems to have done a good job about it because uh, people who work in government in general will be highly likely to believe in the power of government. And uh, one of the most important ideas about the power of government comes from the, what is called the state theory of money, which says that money is whatever the government says is money. So government decides what money is. So if you work at a central bank and if you work at a government, you're highly likely to ascribe to this idea that money is whatever we say it is and money is whatever you can pay your taxes with. And so when something like Bitcoin comes up, you just cannot take it seriously. You have a very hard time taking it seriously and being able to think of it as a serious alternative. And so I think, um, you know, governments are not going to be big fans of Bitcoin. Um, but this is, you know, the contention that I make in my book is that it's not about convincing people. This is economic reality. This is the hardness of money. And so the point I make is that, you know, gold did not become money because it won a popularity contest or because it had a good marketing department or because it had a good team of devs who are working really hard on, um, you know, making good PR for the, for gold to be adopted. Mm -hmm. Gold won its role on the market because it has it has properties, physical and chemical properties that make it work well as money. And a lot of people misunderstand uh, money or are ignorant of money, and they talk about it as well. Money is just a hallucination. Money is just a, a you know a shared hallucination that we all share with each other. If we all agree that we're going to be using uh, toilet paper as money, then we can make toilet paper into money. If we all agree that we want to use um, fish as money, then fish is money. And that's not true. There are properties that make toilet paper and fish useless as money, but that make gold very good as money. And I discussed this in depth in the Bitcoin standard. And the point from discussing this in the Bitcoin standard is that the same thing is repeating with Bitcoin. What makes good money is also present in Bitcoin. Bitcoin has the properties that make good money. And um, fundamentally, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's about the hardness. It's about the irresponsiveness of the demand, of the supply to the demand. And so gold was the best metal for that because it always had the lowest annual supply growth rate. And that's what gave it its key uh, monetary role. Silver had the second highest, about 121 million uh, Bitcoins. 100 years from now, it's going to be only 21 million Bitcoin. But 10 years from now, there's going to be a lot more dollars and there's going to be a lot more euros and a lot more of all the world's national currencies. And also gold, and also bonds and stocks and debt and all kinds of other financial assets. There's very little restraining the ability of the people who produce them to keep making more and more and more of them. And so uh, I think it's just a game of supply and demand that's going to impose itself. There's, there's, we're not going to making more Bitcoin or making very, very little more Bitcoin, uh, but we're making a lot more of everything else. And, uh, you know, demand oscillate and there will be a lot of short term oscillations in demand like we see today. You know, we, we had more than a 50 percent drop over the last uh, three months. But I think the long-term trend is still very clear. It's undeniable. We've had an average of about 200% per year cumulative annual growth rate over the first 10 years, first sure. uh, full 10 years, full calendar years in which Bitcoin has operated. So I don't see that trend subsiding unless somebody figures out a way to make more Bitcoin. And um, if somebody's trying to work on that problem, I wish them the best of luck. <laughs> I've interviewed some Bitcoin skeptics. I've also heard arguments from other people commenting online and otherwise 
against Bitcoin. I'm just going to throw some arguments out there that they've made uh, that I'd like you to comment on. Some of them you've already addressed. So going back to the Bitcoin as a form of payment um, uh, uh, thesis that you've mentioned. Yes, it's true. Uh, it's undeniable that Bitcoin's adoption as a form of payment is picking up. Commentators have noted, however, that uh, Bitcoin's use in the elite investors and speculators of Bitcoin. Uh, can you comment on whether or not that should be of consideration at all? Um, I mean, I think, you know, um, it, it's a technology. Bitcoin is a technology. Bitcoin is not a company. And so it's not like yeah. uh, PayPal is facilitating money laundering or HSBC is facilitating criminal activity. And then it, because you don't like that activity, you take your money out of HSBC. Bitcoin's different. Bitcoin is a lot more like somebody carried out a crime with a knife. Do you go and do you get rid of the knives in your kitchen because, you know, knives are being used for crime? It's it's different. It's a technology that's neutral, that doesn't have an authority that controls it, and anybody can use it. And so it's, mm -hmm. it makes no sense to make one to, to make yourself responsible for how everybody uses every, everybody else uses. It. So you can't well, be held responsible for what knife users do or for what drunk drivers do as a car driver. And I think the same applies for Bitcoin. Having said that, I still think um, you know a lot of criminals are in jail because of Bitcoin because they use Bitcoin and um, they overestimate how private bitcoin is they don't quite get that um privacy on bitcoin is not an easy thing you know it's um it, it, it's not that bitcoin is private or that bitcoin is not private it's similar to thinking about privacy on the internet you know do you have privacy on the internet well it depends on how you're covering your tracks and who's trying to uh, track you down yeah and uh, it's it's an endless um arms race effectively between um sleuths and uh, uh people trying to get away from them so it's you know you can you can achieve privacy on the internet but it's pretty calm on bitcoin and on the internet but it's pretty difficult and it requires expertise and generally you know i i always like to advise anybody who is in crime you know if you're in crime stick to the us dollar it's a more tested and reliable <laughs> way of, uh, you hear that criminals <laughs> Saifdeen has advice for you to launder <laughs> money stick with the us dollar Saifdeen, you're right but authorities well, use this as an opportunity to regulate Bitcoin. I think if you, if you take a look at uh, Elizabeth Warren's uh, testimony to the Senate Banking Committee just a few weeks ago, she said that, and I quote, Bitcoin is used to scam people and she threatened more regulation. Suppose the government does impose more regulation on Bitcoin. Some say that might be a good thing for the financial asset, but what do you think would happen to the price? Do you think, do you think uh, we'll have another incident like what's happening in China where people might might sell off the holdings in, in, in fear? Potentially, yes. I mean, I think, you know, uh, sell-offs in Bitcoin have happened, and I think they're going to continue to happen for a long time, as long as Bitcoin is um, still a tiny part of the global financial system. So um, these these kind of things can happen. But I think the, um, you know, it, 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 it might get ugly with Bitcoin, but I think the, the, the value proposition ultimately is in the fact that nobody can control it, nobody can stop it. And so... Um, in a sense, Bitcoin thrives on adversity because if you do try and knock it down, if you do try and um, hurt it, um, you're just setting up a great comeback story for Bitcoin. And this has sure. been the case with all the, uh, all, all the, all the over the many years. You know, there's been many cases of well, that's it for Bitcoin. You know, China just banned it, or the U.S. just um, shut down the Silk Road website, or. Um, the G7 announced that they're not happy with it. And many times this appeared like it was going to be the end of Bitcoin and then Bitcoin comes back and uh, recovers. And I think we're going to see something similar now with uh, the hash rate recovering. Yeah. Um, we, you know, we get a, a discount on the coins to, to finance essentially the move of the miners and it's going to reduce the amount of money that the miners can hold so it's going to have some impact on the price but i think the dynamic itself is going to reassert itself there's only a fixed number of coins coming on every day and the fact that that continues to operate reliably and the fact that you know we, we essentially half of the uh, roughly half of the mining capacity of the network probably in was in china and if that indeed does leave i mean i think it's it's just absolutely an amazing portrayal of the power of Bitcoin that you can relocate what is an mm -hmm. extraordinarily large amount of industrial capacity from China to all over the world mm -hmm. 
without the network having to be taken offline for 10 minutes. You know, the network is still making blocks every 10 minutes. Maybe the blocks are going to get a little bit slower over the next couple of weeks as this relocation takes place. Yes. But you can still use the network. The network is still operational, which is amazing. You know, so whether it, whatever they're going to try to do, ultimately, and this is what's different between Bitcoin and gold and what's different between Bitcoin and traditional financial assets, Bitcoin's clearance happens independently of the political and um, uh, banking system. Bitcoin has physical clearance, if you want. It's digital, but we can refer to it as physical in the sense of, uh, you know, clearance with metals. You know, there's paper gold and there's physical gold. There's paper gold, there's paper Bitcoin that exists on the, on the uh, balance sheets of uh, regulated financial institutions, just like there's paper gold. But the difference is that the paper, uh, the, the physical Bitcoin market effectively, or the, um, you know, on-chain Bitcoin market is conducting one... Uh, global um, is adding one new block of thousands of new transactions taking place all over the world every 10 minutes so every 10 minutes you're updating the ledger with new transactions from all over the world completely independently of any kind of political authority and so that means that you know if you can't kill that if you can't stop these members of the network from coming together which you know even if you ban mining you can't stop it as, uh, as we're seeing right now um, if you can't do that, if the network can continue to operate even as this is taking place, well, um, then all that you can effectively do is either ba is basically ban yourself from the network. So you can't stop the network. You can either try and impose uh, terms on people who use the network, and if people can accept that terms, they can continue to use it and uh, deal sure. with your institutions. But if you impose terms that are unacceptable for users or that are people cannot accommodate because of the way in which Bitcoin works, then you've just kicked all of your users off the network or kicked all of the Bitcoin users off of your network or off of your central bank or off of your um, taxation system. So you can't really ban Bitcoin. You can ban yourself from Bitcoin, but Bitcoin continues to operate. And I think, uh, you know, even if it's going to be a 50, 60, 70 percent crash, 80 percent crash, I think uh, ultimately the ability to bounce back is uh, what's mm -hmm. going to just win the day for Bitcoin.